I really appreciate everything Josephine just said. Uh, having founded a seed company now almost uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago in fact, and the difficulty of doing it and what it really takes to have a seed company. It's, farmer selections are wonderful, but they narrow the genetic pool, as you can imagine, by making the same selection off the same fields for years and years and years. And the ability to really produce to really produce high quality planting material is a gigantic task on scale. I mean, I don't think most people in this room have any understanding of what scale means when you're, you're talking about a piece of budwood, but you're going to graft onto a tree in Cote d'Ivoire. And Mars alone believes it has to produce one billion pieces of budwood. That's one billion, not 10,000, not a million, not a hundred million, a billion pieces of budwood to have any impact at all. And that's only with 300,000 farmers. That leaves out 600,000 farmers because we're focusing our effort in one region. And, and the reason to talk about failures has to do with private companies, NGOs, not really understanding that you can't stand on the sidelines. We started with Success Alliance, ACDI Avoca in Indonesia. The project was such an abject failure that really it was such a terrible embarrassment, a USAID funded project. Everything was wrong about it. Fertilizer became evil for some reason, and fertilizer did not want to be used. There was no other alternative. Compost had not yet been developed in Indonesia. Germplasm was some sort of complex story that nobody understood, but nobody really wanted to move forward on. Farmer field training was so poorly executed that uh, when we went back to look at it and shook our heads and realized that we had just been standing on the sidelines, right? You pay your money, you get a service, you walk away, you feel good about yourself, and you go on. And in fact, you can't do that at all. Uh, we reinvented farmer field schools in Indonesia, reinvented nurseries in Indonesia, figured out what Josephine referred to as banking. Uh, we became a bank ourselves as a small entity, loaning up to $1,200 to build nurseries to a number of people. And we thought about some of these issues on risk caught in, in, in the insurance business and in the reinsurance business is called smoothing. And how do you smooth the risk for these people across a lot of areas? And then we were invited because um, in 2008 we announced that we would sequence the Theobroma cacao genome and the other little second part of the sentence that almost no one listened to was we are going to give it away. Mars Incorporated did not want to own it. We did not want to protect it. We did not want to defend it. We wanted everyone to have similar access to it and, pat and protect it from patenting, which is a, a pretty crazy thing to do when everybody wants to own everything. <coughs> and in doing that, we made a statement that yields of 450 kilos per hectare globally is poverty. And we had stated in 2008, I had the fortune actually in the UK to state that we would certify our entire supply chain of cacao by 2020, 100% certified sustainable. And then in 2009, it started driving me crazy that how could you actually say you're going to certify poverty? I mean, what a preposterous statement. 450 kilos is poverty. It's horrible. You can't make a good decision in agriculture when you live in poverty. I should have said, and to this day, I regret it. I, I should have said, Mars will certify only prosperity. And the reason to say we will only certify prosperity, it means that all the pieces of the puzzle must reach the farmer. And you can't do that as an NGO working underneath the radar, which happens all the time. You can't do it as a private country, a company coming in and say, we're going to do this for you. That's, a different form of imperialism. You must start, if you can get to the president of the country, which is sometimes hard to do, but Otara is really quite open to this in Cote d'Ivoire, and Koulibaya Sangofoa, who's the Minister of Agriculture, gets it, and the head of CNRI, the National Research Institute, gets it, and the head of the extensionists get it, and we put our money on the table. We said we'll spend 
millions and millions of dollars to see if we can improve the rural cocoa sector in Cote d'Ivoire. Because if you can't, you all are going to be e eating chocolate made of sawdust and artificial flavor, which is probably not a desire. What we realized is that it's backbreaking work to get this done. How do you reach, as uh, Josephine said, the person off the road? How do you make those sort of structural changes? And what we found is that you must put the farmer first. You can't put your, whatever you call it, corporate reputation first. You can't put your government relation first. You must put the farmer first, which is a real paradigm shift. And in doing that, I think the thing that we found out that there's winners and losers in agriculture. And Edmund Phelps, the noted Nobel laureate in economics, and Eleanor Ostrom, who passed away last year, also a Nobel laureate in economics, drove this home to us every time we met with them. They thought we were bumbling fools when we talked about what we believed to be the rural economic potential. They said, no, there's winners and losers. Early adapters win, late adapters lose. And you just have to accept that as a fact of agriculture. Not everyone will rise with the prize. And then we realize that it's hard to make decision in changing circumstances. And I'm known as Dr. No. And uh, the reason for that, because something doesn't work, you should say no, and you should change. You should re rethink the problem, rethink the potential of how you've monitored and evaluated something that's an abject failure. What we learned in a rude way was that we could increase the yield to 1,500 to 2,000 kilos per hectare with good planting material, fertilizer, and the ability to distribute this material with training to the rural sector. What we didn't realize when we made our mind up to this is that the fertilizer that was being sold is based on nitrogen. Nitrogen is not the limiting factor in trees. It turns out it's potassium and phosphorus and micronutrients. So the fertilizer that had been used for 100 years was wrong. So you've got to reinvent that. You've got to put your money on the table, and you have to take care of those issues. The other thing that was shocking to us was the realization that in the rural sector in Africa, over 30 percent of the children are stunted. You want to make yourself feel bad about what you're doing, realize that your intervention of raising the yield on a key commodity, one of the ten largest commodities traded globally, will fail because you have a stunted population of 32 percent of the children. It's worse in India. It's over 40 percent. It's 7 percent in the United States. I didn't have time to look up the statistic in the UK, but it's probably 7 to 8 percent. So then we realized we had to improve the food. It's not just improve the yield. You better improve the food that people eat in the rural sector. So we formed another entity called the African Orphan Crops Consortium with the African Union and a series of technology companies, including the Beijing Genomic Institute, specifically to sequence a hundred of the key food crops and give all that aw information away as possible and build a breeding academy to take that knowledge on marker-assisted selection and improve the qualitative nutritional level of all those crops. Because calories are not the issue, it's nutrition is the issue. And I wish we would change the discussion from food security to nutritional security, because that really gets at the problem. So you start going down a path and you fail, you redo everything you do, you have the world's best experts both in country and around the world help you formulate what has to actually happen, and you pay for it. And then you make your partners the World Bank. I know a lot of people want to vilify the World Bank. They have $1.4 billion to spend on agriculture in, Af in Africa for next year. That's more than everybody in the world is going to spend, including the African nations. And remember, there's $62 billion worth of imports of food to Africa. All I want is 1% of that. We, you know, we'll turn it around. So whatever you think you're doing when you start a project, recognize that this notion of changing circumstances, changing decision-making is critical.
because you don't want to be the person cutting down the last tree on Easter Island not knowing if you should use it for your food or you should make a boat and get the hell out of there. My takeaway message, I think, if I can share with you, is that private industry has a responsibility to spend their profitability in a new way. And it's, it'll be difficult for industry to talk about this. We're privately held. Our owners believe in this. I can't speak for anybody else. I encourage them to think this way. But for structural change that is sustainable in Africa, in Asia, South America, the money has to come from a number of sources. And you cannot have three-year research programs when it takes five to seven years to even understand if a tree is going to be a good tree or a bad tree. So the private sector has to make a commitment for 10 to 15 years. The other thing I'll mention is all this work is forever. If you look at what maize is or what rice is or what soya is or cotton is, they've been breeding these crops intensively for 100 years. So what do you do with cocoa that hasn't been bred at all for 100 years and has the same yield? What do you do with the rural food crops of Africa that have had no improvement? You've got to fix them. So there's more responsibility to feed the people of the world there's a moral responsibility to protect biodiversity, and there's a moral responsibility to translate science into the field, putting the farmer first. Thank you.